So I've opened it up. Okay, thank you. I'll switch myself off now. Greetings to all. My name is Namkolo Kovic. I'm a senior research coordinator at IFPRI on the Agriculture for Nutrition and Health program. And I will be moderating this uh, webinar today. Um, we just give it a few more, uh, perhaps a minute or so to allow people that are in the waiting room to join. Okay, in the interest of time, um, let me introduce myself again for those who've just joined us. <laughs> My name is Namkolo Kovic. I'm a senior research coordinator at IFPRI on the Agriculture for Nutrition and Health program. And I will be your moderator uh, to You are muted. You are muted, Dr. Namuko. Thank you very much. I have been introducing myself to myself. <laughs> so <laughs> greetings to all. Um, my name is Namkolo Kovic. I'm a senior research coordinator at IFPRI. I coordinate the Agriculture for Nutrition and Health program, and I will be your moderator uh, today. Um, for this really uh, great event, I, I really appreciate you taking time to be with us today. Um, and we are going to be looking at addressing hidden hunger in Eastern and Southern Africa and at the progress that has been made specifically on biofortification. This event is co-hosted by the African Development Bank, the African Union Development Agency, NEPAD, and the Harvest Plus program uh, on crop biofortification. The, really a testament to uh, a very significant collaborative engagement on the African continent on this uh, topic of biofortification. Before we start, I just want uh, uh, to bring to you a few housekeeping uh, logistics. We ask that you keep your, uh, your microphones muted and your videos off. The speakers will turn on their videos and microphones when they are speaking, but keep them off the rest of the time. In doing so, we can help those of us who might have challenges with bandwidth to have better uh, connectivity. And we are going to have later on a Q&A uh, session. We have a Q&A uh, chat box that you can use and you can field your questions uh, through there, but do feel free to also make comments in the chat box and these are being monitored. Without wasting much time, um, the first thing that we will do is we will watch a, a video from the African Leaders for Nutrition um, initiative. And this video was actually developed for the Nutrition for Growth event when we initially had it planned for 2020. And so the dates that are going to be given will be for 2020, but we know that this has been postponed and we are now in the Nutrition for Growth season. And next week uh, we have the full-fledged uh, summit taking place. Let me hand over now to my colleague Sagal to play this video. Over to you, Sagal. 
Thank you. Africa's future lies in the hands of our children. But that future is uncertain. With millions of African children not reaching their full physical and cognitive potential due to poor nutrition and stunting, undernourished children learn less and achieve fewer years of school than their healthy peers. As adults, they are less productive in the workforce and earn less income over the course of their lifetime. As African Development Bank President Akinumi Edeshina has said, stunted children today will give you stunted economies tomorrow. On our current trajectory, Africa is unlikely to achieve the World Health Assembly's nutrition targets for the year 2025. But this doesn't need to be our story. For our children or our continent, progress is possible. Since 2000, stunting has declined by 8 percentage points across Africa, with a number of countries showing rapid progress. We've made good progress towards achieving the World Health Assembly's target of 50% of the world's children being exclusively breastfed for the first six months of life. We often think about investing in infrastructure as building roads and bridges. But investing in good nutrition is key to building what the bank has called grey matter infrastructure, so that children can grow up strong in mind and body. Learning more in school and earning more in the workplace. While poor nutrition is the underlying cause of nearly half of all child deaths worldwide, less than 1% of global development assistance focuses on nutrition. And the issue rarely features prominently in national health budgets. The African Leaders for Nutrition addresses this gap. We are inviting powerful voices to join the conversation. Our nutrition champions including current and former heads of state, finance ministers and eminent leaders, are catalyzing political leadership to end malnutrition. And the need for that leadership has never been more urgent. Later this year, Japan will host the 2020 Tokyo Nutrition for Growth Summit. The summit presents an opportunity to transform the way the world tackles malnutrition. Nutrition for Growth is also an opportunity to share Africa's nutrition achievements and signal greater commitment to ensuring healthy diets for all. Increased investment in nutrition is fundamental to driving progress toward the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The African Development Bank is proud to host the African Leaders Nutrition Initiative in partnership with the African Union Commission. Join us in helping all of Africa deliver better nutrition for our children and for long-term inclusive economic growth across the continent. Thank you, thank you very much. Indeed, that video clearly indicates why it is important for us to invest in nutrition. And we are grateful to the African Development Bank and the African Union for really bringing on this very important initiative of the African Leaders for Nutrition. So the, our first speaker today to actually open for us will be um, Mr. Luali Gaba, the Division Manager of Agriculture Research, Production and Sustainability Division at the African Development Bank. And then we really, he will tell us about the multi-sectoral nutrition action plan that the bank has through which they have actually taken on biofortification as one of the strategies to invest on in Africa. And as they say, in order to invest in Africa's gray matter infrastructure. Over to you, uh, Luali Gaba. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Ali, are Thanks, you uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You hear me? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Chair, and uh, good morning, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Uh, 
it is a, a very great pleasure for me to participate to this open session of the LN webinar on uh, biofortification organized with uh, LN champion, Howard Bruce and Herbert Bruce. This joint event is uh, welcomed by the bank, considering that LN is a platform which needs support from experienced organizations like Harvest Plus and uh, very motivated champion like Oort Lewis to engage in such a great undertaking. This uh, successful advocacy event for biotification and food fortification across the continent will help fruit beyond regional boundaries. You must have noticed that interest in biofortification and food fortification and the numerous webinar recently organized on the topic across the world. The bank appreciates to see such initiative prosper under its auspice and that of the African Union Commission through the various regional economic committees tracks. LN is a high level political engagement platform to advocate for urgent intervention to mitigate the malnutrition crisis in Africa. Since its establishment, the African Leaders for Nutrition, ALN, has been engaging high-level political leadership in increasing resources dedicated to improving nutrition outcome, thus supporting the bank high five objectives aiming at feed Africa and improving the quality of life. It is in this band that LN is co organizing this important webinar to promote beautification in Africa. I'm happy to see this, that this is the third of the series of uh, the three webinars that you, we, we plan to organize together. We did this in uh, the other region also. Food fortification is one of the bank agenda and it contrib contributes towards the fight against malnutrition. The bank role in food fortification is mainly done through education to promote the production of nutritious and healthy food. Biotification is staple food have, has been identified as a cost-effective and sustainable means of delivering micronutrients to population who have limited access to diverse diet and other micronutrient intervention. Several countries in Africa have adopted policies and strategies that promote biotification as a sustainable source of micronutrient. African development through a program, Technologies for African Agricultural Transformation, that has demonstrated the possibility of raising productivity and production of nutritious, uh, nutritious food in Africa, presently focusing on nine commodities, cassava, maize, rice, sorghum millet, orange flesh, sweet potato, wheat, high iron beans, small livestock, and aquaculture. That is supporting the scaling up of biotified varieties through breeding of specific staple crops for increased nutritional content in Africa. This is based on sufficient scientific evidence that biofortified crops have nutrition impact. I would like to cite example of bank projects, some example of bank project and initiative under this partnership that. The first example is the project we have in Ethiopia, named multi-sectoral approach for stunting reduction project, approved in April 2000, in April of this year. This project plans to train and provide 100% of irrigation water user group to use nutrient-dense uh, nutrient seed seedlings such as high iron beans, four peas, mang beans, high quality protein, maize, among others, and promoting the growing of vegetal and fruit. The second project is the TAT Savannah, what you call TAT S, which is one of the eight priority intervention areas of the Feed Africa strategy that seek to end extreme poverty, hunger, malnutrition, and food import by 2020, 2025. 
that has seek to transform X million hectare out of Africa's 400 million hectare of savanna, twist the size of uh, Brazilian Cerrado and, uh, and there uh, and to a uh, breed basket for the production of maize, soybean, and livestock. That S was launched in October 2017 in Ghana and has been since launched in other countries like Zambia, Guinea, Gabon, and later in five other African countries, including Uganda, Kenya, Democratic Republic of Congo, Central, Central African Republic, and Mozambique. In DSC in 2017, the African Seed Access Index team conducted with the support of that a comprehensive assessment of a seed sector that revealed multiple gaps in the seed sector, such as the lack of national seed law and of capacity in the national seed services at central and local, the high prevalence of uh, quantified seed, the lack of quality, and as a TET policy sustainable compact, the TASA team is building on a strategy document for the implementation of the recommendation of the assessment by providing technical support to local seed sector players in DSC. And in Egypt, TAT has also implemented, it uh, is implementing its aquaculture compact and organize a technological demonstration training on proven aquaculture technologies and best management practice for representative of 10 African countries from National Agriculture Research and Extension System NERES and Aquaculture Value Chain Actor to improve the skill in running aquaculture production system back in the countries. And the last project is a multinational NERICA rice distribution project towards sustainable aquaculture agriculture, sorry. The project covers seven West African countries and Nerica rice varieties mature more quickly and are much more weed resistance. Varieties in a, with a protein content 25% higher plant than the average are being promoted. The project started in since 2000, 2005 and is still going ongoing with extension. Several varieties are under evaluation in Tanzania, Kenya, Madagascar, Congo, and Gabon. So I would not conclude without emphasizing that as Masonis in the orange flesh sweet potatoes distribution, parallel to the beautification breeding, other improving new varieties are being introduced to improve productivity, namely heat resistant, drought tolerant, short duration, high yielding crops such as Nerica, yielding up to three ton per hectare against the less than one ton per hectare with the traditional long duration and yielding varieties. Nerica can be grown twist as a year, a year again, against us a year traditionally. These combined efforts are proven to be effective in reducing food insecurity and malnutrition effectively creating jobs for youth in particular and helping countries reduce food import. The challenge is to push them at scale to make millions of farmers benefit from these technologies and billions of poor, people, uh, poor population access to those certified and proven nutrition food. African Development Bank is indeed ready to assist private sector entrepreneurs who could like, would like, sorry, to invest in food fortification business as it is an effective and efficient way to make healthy food available and accessible to all. In addition to mobilizing resources for nutrition and intervention from the private sector, the Bank Nutrition Program aim also to catalyze innovative private sector investment to increase availability and accessibility of nutritious food such as large-scale food fortification. The bank capacity to engage with the private sector will be any assess to deepening the goal of reducing stating by 2025 and beyond at the international level. I would also like to convey 
heartfelt thanks of the of President Asdesina to his friend, the tireless beautification advocate. I will name here Howard Bruce and Harvest Bruce that accept to co-host this event and did not spare any effort in the organization of this webinar, bringing in very eminent personalities and beautification champion that I would also like to thank here for, the, for accepting to be part of this event. Thank you for your attention and I wish you a very fruitful meeting. Thank you, Cher. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Gaba. It's, it's really, um, it's, it's very heartening to see a development bank actually come on board so strongly to invest in nutrition. And, and this is really very much uh, commendable. Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, we move on now to a Mentimeter poll, just to test us a little bit about our knowledge on biofortification and the progress that we seem to be making in the Southern and Eastern Africa region. So I pass on again to my colleague, Sagal, uh, for the Mentimeter. Sagal, over to you. Thank you very much. So for everyone, if you could just go into the chat box, you'll find a link that'll let you access the Mentimeter. And what you'll see is something like this. So I already see someone's already started. So we're just, as Namukula said, we're going to be just having a little bit of a, an icebreaker through some fun questions that are relevant to the regions that we're talking about today. So in this case, um, in which East African country did the Minister of Agriculture inaugurate work of a national biofortification technical working group in 2019? So we'll give everyone uh, perhaps 10 seconds to just pick their, pick their choice and then I'll highlight which is the correct one. So we have a nice uh, collection of responses. Um, the correct response is actually that this happened in uh, Uganda. There we go. Um, and in the next question, which will now open for everyone to respond to, when eaten regularly, vitamin A biofortified maize can provide up to what percentage of daily vitamin A needs for women and young children? So let's have maybe another 10 seconds or so for our participants to respond. Okay, well, I think we have a few um, <laughs> quite well versed biofortified expertise in the participants today. So the response that's correct is 50% of biofortified maize um, is provided with the daily uh, vitamin A needs. So now I'm going to return back to Namukulo, who's going to, I think, now introduce Howdy Bui. Um, so now I return to you, Namukulo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before I let you go, Sigal, because your slide on the results of the Mentimeter didn't show, what percentage of us managed to get the 50%? Apologies, I didn't know this was not showing. Um, it only shows the number. So we have, a lot, well, I don't know now if it's been. <laughs> so 50%, 50% of the audience got the right answer. That is really great. Well, 50% of your vitamin A uh, requirements from uh, your vitamin A biofortified maize is actually very good because you're not eating just the maize, you're supposed to eat it with all the vegetables and the other uh, foods. So it's really very good. Um, and now it is really my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, who is Dr. Howdy Boyce. He is an, an Africa Leaders for Nutrition champion, but I don't think you can get a better champion for biofortification uh, like Dr. Boyce. He is the founding um, director of Harvest Plus and really worked with the idea from scratch, from 
really just suggesting that why can't we breed more micronutrients into uh, our staple foods to where we are today. He is also the 2016 World Food Prize co-laureate, um, and he will make his uh, keynote presentation. I'm sure he'll tell us on how we got where we are today with biofortification. Howdy, over to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction, Namakolo. Um, <clears throat> so I'd uh, like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about linking agriculture and nutrition, an overview of biofortification and Harvest Plus. I'm addressing you from our home in Los Banos, Philippines, where my wife and I have retired in my wife's hometown. Los Banos is the home of the University of the Philippines Premier Agricultural University, and it's the headquarters of the International Rice Research Institute. So uh, we'll go to the next slide. <clears throat> so there's no, there's no one strategy that will solve the problem of mineral and vitamin deficiencies. A mix of strategies is required. Each has its own particular comparative advantages and drawbacks. Some can be implemented relatively quickly, which relieves current untold suffering, but these tend to be more expensive. Are governments willing to maintain recurrent expenditures year after year for shorter term strategies? Agricultural strategies are lower cost, but take longer to implement. A theme that I'll re return to later is whether policymakers have the patience and perseverance to pursue longer term strategies that avoid the same recurrent costs year after year and are more resilient and more sustainable. So next slide, please. Okay, when the issue of mineral and vitamin deficiencies was first recognized, the nutrition community began with programs to provide supplements and food fortification, which filled the gaps but did not directly treat the underlying problem of poor quality diets. For example, 10 billion, that's with a B, 10 billion vitamin A supplements have been given out over the past 20 years to preschool children, saving millions of lives. The cost is one to two dollars per supplement. Countries must continue to spend year after year for supplements and food fortification. So next slide. This simple stylistic diagram makes the point that it is much more cost effective and sustainable for agriculture to supply a higher percentage of the minerals and vitamins that people need at affordable prices, as represented by the green shaded portion of the rectangles, which represent total mineral and vitamin requirements. Initially, the nutrition community was focused on filling the yellow gaps in the diagram, not growing the green supply of nutrients from agriculture. <clears throat> Next slide. As we look to the future, <clears throat> we can break down the specific activities to be undertaken within agriculture into two broad groups. First, those activities which focus on food staples, which must increase the density of minerals and vitamins. Consumers already eat maximum amount of food staples. Second, those activities which focus on non-staple foods must seek to increase the quantities eaten. Fundamentally, the second strategy is only possible if income can be increased and food prices can be lowered. Both broad strategies need to be pursued simultaneously. Next slide. Food staples are not dense in minerals and vitamins. However, the absolute intake of minerals and vitamins from food staples is a result of multiplying quantities consumed times the density. The first term in this multiplication, quantities consumed of food staples is a high number. Thus, as this slide shows, milled rice in the Philippines 
provides a very significant proportion of a wide range of minerals and vitamins in diets. In fact, no single food in the Philippines provides more nutrients than rice. The objective then within the substrategy of focusing on food staples is to increase densities. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I myself have worked for more than 25 years to promote and implement a strategy of biofortification through plant breeding. This picture shows a deep orange maize developed through conventional plant breeding, which is high in vitamin A. Africans eat white maize, which has no vitamin A, but vitamin A deficiencies are widespread. The orange mazes are high yielding and sell for the same price as white maize getting Africans to substitute orange maize for white maize in their diets will go a long way toward eliminating vitamin A deficiency at no extra cost to consumers. Next slide. Several types of biofortified, several types of biofortified crops are now released in 40 countries and are in testing for release in more than 20 additional countries. Some crops have more vitamin A, some crops have more iron, some crops have more zinc. Next slide. This map simply shows the 63 countries where releases already have been approved or are in testing for release. Biofortification is truly a global strategy. Next slide. You cannot read the detail in this chart, which is available on the Harvest Plus website and which shows which crops are released or are in testing in all 63 countries. The statistics include orange sweet potato varieties developed and disseminated through the International Potato Center, which is not a part of Harvest Plus. Presentations to follow will provide specific information on biofortified crop varieties available in Eastern and Southern Africa and about delivery strategies. Next slide, please. This is an older map which tries to convey all of the previous detail on one slide. Nearly 400 biofortified crop varieties have been released in low and middle income countries. Biofortified crops are being grown by a minimum estimate of 10 million farm households globally. Harvest Plus now is striving to make the numbers of, and producers of biofortified crops much higher in the hundreds of millions. Next slide. It is important to note that there is a wealth of evidence now in the nutrition literature that increasing the density of vitamin A, iron and zinc in food staples improves the micronutrient status and demonstrates even that functional outcomes are improved, such as less sickness and better cognitive and work performance. Others will present later on in the program on delivery activities to scale uptake of biofortified crops uh, to farmers and consumers. Next slide, please. I turn now to vegetables, fruits, pulses, animal products, those foods which are already dense in minerals and vitamins. In my opinion, the fundamental strategy should be to increase the supply of specific key foods that can contribute importantly to nutrient intakes where supply can be increased cost effectively through public policy and investments. There are two fundamental points to make here. First, the primary objective is to lower the price of these specific foods. Second, these specific foods will vary greatly by country, depending on dietary patterns. Next slide, please. I find food systems to be a very broad and complex concept that can be paralyzing in terms of determining specific actionable interventions. My advice is to start with the specific foods that can make a difference 
then do what is necessary within particular food systems to relieve constraints in expanding supply and lowering the price. A perfect example is provided by the work of 2019 World Food Prize laureate Simon Groot. For decades, his East West Seed Company has been expanding, developing, and disseminating hybrid vegetable seeds in Africa and Asia. Farmer productivity is increased while more rapidly growing supplies allow for the possibility of falling prices of vegetables. Next slide. Let me make a few comments on the resolve or lack thereof of agricultural policymakers to work with the nutrition community on reducing malnutrition and improving health. First, let me make the quick point that focusing on food staples offers advantages under the COVID pandemic. Dietary quality is worsening as incomes fall. There is continued high levels of consumption of food staples, however, and a government focus on ensuring food staple supplies. Food staple approaches to increasing density offer extra minerals and vitamins and diets at no extra cost to consumers. Apart from short, runs concern, short run concerns about COVID, to address malnutrition, we need a mix of all approaches, short run nutrition direct, such as supplementation and commercial fortification, and long run nutrition smart interventions that treat the underlying causes and make the foundation of food systems more nutritious. It is a matter of finding leaders and champions for each individual approach and persevering. We need to bring more funding under the overall nutrition umbrella. Next slide, please. Although they are cost efficient, sustainable and resilient, a drawback to agricultural approaches are the long gestation periods. It takes many years, often decades, to have large scale impacts globally. As parents, we invest in our children's education over 20 years. Can policymakers and donors take the same long term perspective with agriculture? The long term payoffs are very high. Agricultural policymakers are accustomed to focusing on increasing agricultural productivity and rural incomes, reducing poverty. Asking them also to give priority to a nutrition lens is a relatively new idea. Some progress has been made, which might be discussed in the question and answer period. It is important to have positive examples to show, which can incentivize further momentum. Next slide. On one of my visits to FAO headquarters in Rome, I was waiting to meet someone in the main lobby. I noticed a small plaque on the wall and I went over to read it. Here's what it said. In this building, 16th of October, 1945, representatives of 44 nations met and established the Food and Agricultural Organization, first of the new United Nations agencies. Thus, for the first time, nations organized to raise levels of nutrition and to improve production and distribution of food and agricultural products. I thought, wow, 75 years ago, the policymakers mentioned nutrition first and agricultural supply second. What has happened in the meantime? Next slide, please. In closing, let me read this quote, which has inspired me over many years. Such intimately related subjects as agriculture, food, nutrition, and health have become split up into innumerable rigid and self-contained little units, each in the hands of some group of specialists. The experts soon find themselves learning more and more about less and less. The remedy is to look at the whole field covered by crop production, animal husbandry, food, nutrition, and health as one related subject and to realize that the birthright of every crop, every animal, and every human being is health. Next slide, please. This quote sounds very contemporary, but it was written again in 1945. 
These ideas and concepts, broadly speaking, have been around for a long time, but it takes leadership and perseverance to put them into practice. Next slide. Thank you very much for listening. I look forward to the discussions to follow. Thank you very much, Howdy. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, indeed, we've come a long way uh, on the biofortification uh, route, and it, it's nice to see the trajectory of events to where we are now. And so for the next speakers where we get into the panelists, we'll get a bit more information on what is actually happening in the Southern and Eastern Africa uh, region. But before we get into that, I would like to remind uh, our audience that we have a Q&A function and you can add questions to any of the speakers in the Q&A. And if you have comments that you would like to share, uh, links to perhaps resources that you would like to bring to others' attention, feel free to do so in the chat as well. And these are both being monitored. So I remind you to please add your questions to the Q&A. The next item before we go into the, the panel uh, discussion is to look at a video of the Harvest Plus story. Um, over to you again, uh, Sigal. More than 2 billion people aren't getting enough essential vitamins and minerals in their diets. This form of malnutrition, known as hidden hunger, results in serious health and developmental problems. Young children and women are particularly at risk. Hidden hunger is widespread in many low- and middle-income countries, especially in rural areas. Billions of people in these countries cannot afford or readily access all the elements of a healthy diet. Instead, they rely on lower-nutrient, lower-cost staple crops to fill their plates. But there is a way to make these staples deliver better nutrition, affordably and sustainably. Harvest Plus, along with global and national crop research partners, has developed hundreds of varieties of wheat, rice, maize, beans, and other common staples to be rich in iron, zinc, and vitamin A. We co-developed these crops with smallholder farmers who participate in field testing and selection of varieties to ensure a demand-led process. Today, Close to 10 million farming families are growing, eating, and benefiting from these conventionally bred by fortified crops. They are scientifically shown to improve nutritional status, health outcomes, immune system strength, and mental and physical performance. Farmers like that they're also high yielding and climate smart and cost no more to grow than standard crop varieties. Plus the nutritional value stays in the plant harvest after harvest. Biofortified crops also offer new livelihood opportunities for farmers as well as businesses operating in seed and food value chains. Harvest Plus is leading a global drive to rapidly scale up this proven, equitable nutrition innovation to reach hundreds of millions more rural farming families and low-income urban consumers. We provide technical assistance, strategic guidance, capacity strengthening, and policy engagement support to public, private, and NGO partners worldwide who are forging the path to scale. Partner with us to make better nutrition available and affordable to all families everywhere by making biofortified crops and foods the foundation of resilient food systems. Help us end hidden hunger and improve the lives of both current and future generations. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, indeed, biofortification is an important strategy to addressing uh, hidden hunger. For our panel now, we start with Mr. Donald Mavindize, Harvest Plus Africa Regional Director. And he will uh, speak to us about the Harvest Plus biofortification activities in Eastern and Southern Africa. Mr. Mavindize, over to you.
Good morning. Uh, Good Donald? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Good afternoon and good morning, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, depending on where you are, uh, you are listening from around the world. It gives me great pleasure to be part of this discussion and to be able to share some of our experiences. Uh, I want to begin by giving a brief overview of our work at Harvest Plus in Africa. For the past decade and a half, Harvest Plus has been working on biofortification in Africa with various partners to complement other interventions uh, such as industrial food fortification and supplementation and indeed uh, uh, dietary diversity in this fight against uh, hidden hunger. Just like Howdy mentioned in his presentation, in Africa we have targeted the traditional and popular staples because they are the most affordable food group for most communities where we work. And uh, generally in Africa, people eat what they grow. Working with our various partners, we have been quite successful. As, and, and, and since 2004, Harvest Plus has supported the release of more than 200 varieties of 15, uh, uh, 200 varieties of biofortified crops in 15 countries. Uh, in Africa alone. So in Africa, 15 countries in Africa alone, forming the bulk of the varieties that have been released under the biofortification program. The varieties that have been released in Africa include those which are rich in vitamin A, and here namely maize, uh, cassava, and sweet potato. And those that are rich in iron, namely beans uh, and pearl millet. Research is still ongoing and is, is quite at an advanced stage to also release crops that are high in zinc, such as rice and maize. And we are very excited about this as rice is a major staple that continues to grow in, in popularity on the continent. And this is coupled with the fact that zinc deficiency is also a major problem. A number of years ago, uh, Harvest Plus began uh, the work of scaling this innovation. And to, to date, we, have, um, we estimate that more than 6.5 million uh, farming families or households are growing these crops with more than uh, 32 million benefiting, 32 million people benefiting in Africa. Uh, we, are all, we, are, we are only starting, we're only getting uh, started, it's just at the beginning. Uh, we have a long way to go because the problem of malnutrition uh, in Africa is dire. The recent SOFI report say, you know, highlights that three quarters of Africans can't afford a healthy diet and more than 50% can't afford a nutrient adequate diet. And uh, so we believe that biofortification can make a significant uh, uh, contribution in mitigating uh, this problem. To, uh, to achieve scale, we have realized that uh, we need to follow a value chain approach and crowd in different types of uh, partners, who are both public and private and even uh, development partners uh, to, uh, to, so that we can create long-term sustainability in these value chains. Through our strategy of catalyzing uh, scale, we work to ensure that uh, there is adequate supply of quality uh, seed and planting material. And for example, in Malawi, working with the national, uh, uh, national breeding program, uh, it has led to the release of 10 varieties of vitamin A maize, three varieties of high iron beans, and eight varieties of, uh, of uh, orange flesh sweet potato. And in Malawi, we are also working with private and public uh, systems to make sure that we facilitate the availability of early generation seed to the various companies and um, other stakeholders so as to make sure that biofortified varieties are more wild, widely available to farming families. The second pillar in our strategy is to stimulate a demand along the value chain using um, either commercial or social models. For example, we have a project to commercialize high iron beans and vitamin A maize value chains in Kenya and Tanzania. And here we've been working with various communities 
uh, working, and we've also been working with various uh, commercial enterprises to raise the awareness and interest in these biofortified crops. The third pillar in our strategy is advancing enabling environments. For working with various partners, we have been advocating for the inclusion of biofortification in policies, um, in programs and budgets at different levels, at country level, at regional level, and even at continental level. And for example, uh, this work has led to the inclusion of vitamin A maize uh, in the government in, in Zambia's uh, uh, the government of Zambia's input sub, uh, subsidy program. And uh, similarly in Zimbabwe, biofortification has been incorporated as a major component of the government's food fortification strategy. Our fourth and final pillar is that we see ourselves as a thought leader in this area of biofortification. Bio and so we work to marshal evidence and support independent research in nutritional impact, adoption, and cost effectiveness. We believe in convening experts and stakeholders to share knowledge, um, lessons, and know-how in the area of biofortification. And we've uh, formed quite a number of platforms uh, around the continent. Uh, a typical example is that of Uganda, where we have set up a biofortification, biofortification technical working group together with the Minister of Agriculture. And this is a platform that consists of a cross section of uh, stakeholders. Uh, this can be public, private, and even academia, which meets regularly and uh, deliberates and explores ways of how we can advance this technology in Uganda. I'd like to thank you very much for listening and I'm looking forward to the discussion that we'll have. And uh, please uh, feel free to uh, ask uh, questions uh, and I'll be happy also to uh, respond to any questions during the Q&A session. Uh, you can ask your questions in the chat box in the meantime. Thank you very much and over to you, Namkolo. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mavindiz. Indeed, uh, a lot of activities on biofortification in the region. Um, we will take questions later on in the Q&A. For now, we will listen to our speakers. The next speaker, we are now moving to a regional uh, perspective. And so our speaker is Mr. Amin Idris Adum, Director of Program Implementation and Deliveries at uh, Directorate at the African Union Development Agency, uh, NEPAD. And he will... Um, really relate to us how AUDA NEPAD's activities in biofortification together with um, Harvest Plus are evolving. Over to you, uh, Mr. Amin. Thank you very much, uh, Program uh, Director, and uh, thank you to the organizers. Ladies and gentlemen, my name uh, is Amin Idris, and uh, I'm in charge of the Directorate of Program uh, Delivery and Coordination at the African Union Development uh, Agency. When it comes to nutrition, uh, Oda Nepat have developed uh, a strategy that have uh, quite a number of pillars, and uh, they are actually uh, seven. First one is the homegrown school feeding program. I will come back to it. Second one is the maternal and young child and nutrition program. Then we have the food fortif fortification and biofortification. I will come back to that as well. We have as well uh, quite a number of projects on food safety and quality, uh, then diet dietary uh, diversity. Uh, we are linking actually nutrition and uh, non-communicable disease. Uh, this is the number six. And finally, uh, we work as well, uh, work out the interlinkages between communicable disease, the NCDs, and the socioeconomic uh, development. So that's the approach we are actually really taking in uh, Oda Nepad to address the issue of uh, nutrition. We believe firmly at Oda Nepad that uh, nutrition is a key factor for African uh, development and therefore must be uh, tackled uh, properly at the continental level, regional level, but as a national and uh, local uh, level. When it comes to addressing the issue of uh, hidden anger through uh, food bio uh, fortification, we would like to say uh, this. There is an estimated 2 billion people actually in the world that are affected by deficiencies, uh, uh, especially of uh, essential 
uh, vitamins and minerals, which is collectively known as uh, the hidden uh, hunger. Young children and women uh, of uh, reproductive age in developing countries, especially in our countries in Africa, are the hardest uh, hit uh, by this uh, issue. And addressing micronutrition and nutrient uh, deficiencies through food fortification, biofortification, and supplementation is one of the practical, I would say, food-based solution uh, that uh, we are promoting to address actually this issue of the uh, hidden uh, hunger. We have, uh, of course, uh, used uh, at the daily basis, I think the nutrients are regularly used in grain, uh, like uh, the millet, the sorghum, uh, especially. So therefore, fortifying millet, uh, sorghum, uh, that will help to prevent disease and strengthen uh, our immune systems and improve fossil productivity and cognitive uh, development, uh, of course. So this is really uh, the way we are tackling actually uh, this issue of the hidden uh, hunger. I know at the continental level, we do actually really promote a lot of advocacy and uh, we are looking forward with member states, and countries, but also regional economic communities to make sure that we have a national uh, policies that will really support this uh, direction. When it comes to school feeding uh, programs, uh, we really invest uh, in school feeding programs to make sure that the school feeding meals are really bio uh, fortified. In 2003, uh, the, our governments in Africa actually, uh, under uh, they have developed the Comprehensive Africa Agricultural Development uh, Program, and one of the key area of intervention of the CADEP uh, is uh, to bring specific intervention to address food and nutrition uh, security. And this is actually key. Uh, it's a very it's a key policy, uh, the CADEP policy that was developed by the way by that was actually led by the African Union Development uh, Agency. As of today, we Think that there is about 370 million children in our continent who really depends on uh, school meals for a significant part of their daily uh, sus uh, daily actual subsistence and those meals uh, play a key role in determining uh, whether those children who succeed in school and are able to set the path for healthy and productive uh, adulthood therefore uh, cadet uh, really have put a very serious emphasis on uh, nutrition so our nutrition program uh, is derived directly from this continental uh, policy. Uh, school age children and adolescents, uh, therefore, in the continent, they benefit from uh, eating biofortified foods, uh, such as uh, talking about the sorghum, the millet, but also orange flesh, uh, sweet potatoes, a source of vitamin A to, to, to improve uh, night vision, for, uh, for example. And this is extremely important. It's a program that we are promoting at the continent. To give you an example, uh, we have conducted a study like in Zambia that have shown that, that have provided evidence that uh, using biofortified mice with uh, vitamin A uh, improve really quality uh, of diet, but also uh, school uh, results. So uh, I think that it's, uh, it's something, it's a program which is actually very important. What we are trying to do uh, from now, actually, especially for next year, is to bring in this school feeding program, additional partners and especially actually uh, private sectors because uh, private sector, uh, especially international uh, multinational companies such as uh, uh, the, the, the food actually uh, companies, I will just name some of them, uh, Unilever or Nestle or Kraft uh, or Mars. Uh, they do also have uh, quite uh, important uh, school feeding program, but they are not homegrown school feeding program as the one that we are promoting. We believe that to have uh, a school feeding program which is sustainable, it must be as well a homegrown school feeding program. That's the reason why we are going to partner with them and make sure that uh, we really move uh, together, uh, all together to, 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 to not only uh, create additional school feeding program at the country, but those school feeding programs must be homegrown school feeding uh, program. In our collaboration with uh, Harvest Plus uh, to advance biofortification in Africa, in 2013, we have collaborated uh, with Harvest Plus to implement the CADEP Nutrition Initiative, to mainstream nutrition uh, within the CADEP. As I said, uh, the nutrition is a very important key element. It's a key element of the CADEP, but we should 
we 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 were supposed actually to mainstream it, and we did it actually in collaboration with uh, Harvest uh, Plus. So this was a value a valuable opportunity for us to advance uh, education, boost local economies, uh, as well through some of the programs that we have been uh, doing together. And right now, currently. Uh, with Harvest Plus, we have signed an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, to work together to promote the production and consumption of biofortified crops and products of all varieties uh, as a key element in nutrition diets among vulnerable population in Africa, as well as on consumers who may have access to other nutritious uh, foods. Uh, so, and this is, uh, we believe is important because it's, uh, it's something that will contribute uh, heavily to better health, and uh, to, to make actually people having better life. Uh, this collaboration would also explore different ways to educate consumers about the health and nutrition benefits of biofortified crops, for example, and value, uh, value add to biofortified products. And it will seek out as well uh, opportunities to work uh, much in a much effective way with the private sector and governments. So we can actually help uh, governments to advance uh, national policy about uh, nutrition, but also for additional investment and commitment to our uh, biofortification uh, technology. So together, actually, uh, we are investing in advocacy, policy reforms, and financial institution investment as well. And uh, we are really uh, hoping that we can bring additional partners uh, on that. So that will help us as well to uh, really push uh, toward achieving uh, our objective, uh, the one for the CAREP, but also the one uh, from the Malabo uh, Declaration, and obviously our Agenda 2063 uh, aspirations uh, to fight against uh, hidden hunger and malnutrition in Africa. In conclusion, ladies and uh, gentlemen, uh, what I would like to say is that for the continued success of fortification and biofortification across the continent, uh, we really need uh, a better understanding of our environment, the institutional uh, policies, and the constraints at the national uh, level. This is actually key, and that's require additional investment and additional commitment actually from all uh, the actors. But despite uh, those contextual uh, complexities, uh, we believe that fortification and biofortification interventions are key, and they are really key contributors to reduce nutrition uh, deficiencies across uh, the continent in all our countries. As such, our organization have prioritized to support the regional economic communities and our member states, number one, to develop strategic uh, coordinated uh, fortification and biofortification intervention that include, uh, that, that, that actually would uh, include uh, I would say interventions uh, that are public sector led, but also voluntary contribution. Um, can anybody hear me? Yes, Hello? we can hear you, Namukolo. Okay, so it looks like we have lost um, Mr. Amin. Amin. Um, but but in any case, it was an excellent um, indication of how potentially things can really come and gel together on the African continent. I mean, I can't get over the fact that we can reach 370 million children through school feeding with biofortified crops. That is an excellent opportunity that we can leverage. And, and it really remains to us in the countries in how we actually leverage this big opportunity of reaching uh, many of our population that need micronutrients. And so let me then now take us on a tour of the Southern and Eastern Africa region, starting first in Tanzania with Mr. Ma with Miss Margaret Matai, nutritionist at the Ministry of Health. And she oh. will uh, describe for us some experiences from Tanzania. Over to you, uh, Miss Matai. Margaret? Um, Namukolo, I don't think uh, Ms. Natai is here. Uh -huh. Okay, so we lose out on Tanzania, but we can move on to Uganda. Um, and in Uganda, we have Dr. 
uh, Godfrey Asia, Director of National Crops Resources Research Institute. Uh, over to you, Dr. Godfrey. Do we have him? Liz, can you indicate if we have Dr. Godfrey with us today? Yes, he was here earlier. Let me just check whether he's still here. He's being asked to unmute, being unmuted. Uh, Dr. Godfrey, can you unmute yourself? Okay, while we are trying to reach God, Dr. Godfrey, in the interest of time, let's move on uh, on our tour. And we are now in Zimbabwe. And here we are with Mr. Uh, Andrea Njovu, Deputy Director, Nutrition Ministry of Health, and then uh, Child Care in Zimbabwe. Over to you, Mr. Njovu. Uh, thank you very much, Namkolo. Uh, you have the one. Uh, I'll be sharing experiences from, from Zimbabwe. Uh, let me see if I can share my video, but uh, my network is, 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 a, is a bit weak. But nonetheless, maybe we can move on with the, with the slides. So I'll be sharing my, uh, our experience in Zimbabwe in terms of fortification. So our first slide here is talking about how Zimbabwe has adopted uh, the multi sectoral collaboration in terms of uh, responding to nutrition and, and specifically to micronutrient deficiencies. We basically all these strategies that you are seeing on these slides have been incorporated in different uh, policies and strategies as part of our, our response. Uh, next slide. So basically Zimbabwe adopted the fortification model in 2014 when we launched our national food fortification strategy. But this strategy was basically fo focusing on industrial fortification. And the, through lessons learned during that period, uh, we are revising, if it were almost finalizing our food fortification strategy for 2022 to 2026. And we have basically added uh biofortification is a, is one of the major uh strategies for addressing micronutrient deficiencies as well as home fortification next slide so focusing on biofortification uh we officially launched the biofortification as a method or as a method of um addressing micronutrient deficiency in 2016 and we are primarily focusing on the uh, orange maize, iron rich beans, as well as orange fleshed sweet potatoes. Uh, this was uh, initiated in 18 districts where the biofortification was part and parcel of an integrated approach where extension and the advisory services were also part and parcel of the package. Uh, raw financing was part of the package. Uh, market development was we would want to ensure that our, our farmers, when they produce, they are not only producing for their own consumption, but also for distribution and for marketing themselves. And they ensure that, that, that they also get finances. We also had policy and knowledge management as part of the, of the program that supported Zimbabwe in terms of uh, gathering evidence for biofortification. Next slide. So in terms of opportunities, um, biofortification is now part of the development strategy, which is uh, for the period 2021 to 2025. And the biofortification is one of the major outputs and we an indicator for part of the food and nutrition uh performance framework so for, for 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 us this really is an opportunity to ensure that we prop up uh the production and the consumption of biofortification and uh, also have it as a as a, as a 
is a high level uh, intervention that is taken up by our politicians, our policy makers for, for, for onward transmission and ensure that we, 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 we gather all the momentum that, that we would need to ensure we have bio fortification up and, and, and running. And the, to also address this, we are advocating uh, for the incorporation of biofortified seeds in the government development, um, government agricultural inputs scheme. And the evidence from uh, the 13 pilot districts uh, showed us that biofortification has been identified as having advantages for reaching uh, poor communities, uh, living in remote rural areas with no or limited access to the industrial uh, fortified foods. And uh, that these communities often rely on substance farming and can grow and consume and sell their own uh, fortified uh, crops within themselves. And this ensures that we are also increasing our households consuming biofortified foods. And also when targeted correctly, uh, biofortification can enable food systems to deliver more nutritious food um, cost, uh, cost effectively. I think we are, we, are, we are in the era of food systems transformation. We'd want to also ensure that we are transforming our food system to ensure that they are cost effective in the providing uh, bio fortified uh, uh, foods. Uh, next slide. So as we, as we move forward in terms of our opportunities, we'd want to really work on improving our policy and legislation uh, towards strengthening biofortification. We also want to have adequate uh, uh, and efficient supply for, pro for propagation of materials and other inputs for biofortified cropping. Um, for, for, like, like, for example, we are talking about uh, having uh, the uh, government agricultural inputs supporting uh, uh, households in, with, uh, with uh, biofortified seeds. But currently, as, as, as a country, we have limited supply in terms of biofortified seeds for the orange maize, for the for the iron rich beans, for the orange sweet potato. So this is really a key area that we would want to ensure that we, we, we focus on and the create public private partnerships between government and the, the city seed manufacturers to ensure that we would adequate um biofortified seeds for 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 our farmers to 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 to, to utilize. Then of course evidence based the advocacy and awareness from biofortification. Uh, as well as monitoring and evaluation and operational research, because we are we are continuously wanting to learn and improve uh, on our on our programming. Then, uh, lastly, the resources we uh, we are still uh, pushing for that, and by having it as part of our national development agenda, definitely we we, we feel that we are positioning it in the in the, in the right track to ensure that it also gets um, uh, resources. So basically, that that's, that has been our experience as, as Zimbabwe. And I look forward to the discussions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Njovu. Really quite a broad perspective of different activities ongoing around biofortification in Zimbabwe. Um, let's move on um, a little bit north of Zimbabwe in Malawi to Ms. Fanny Gondwe the founder and executive director of Perisha Agro and Packaging Enterprise. And, and she will uh, share some experiences uh, from Malawi on issues, including, uh, I think probably enabling uh, government environment, how you are dealing with that. Over to you, Ms. Gondwe. Thank you so much. Uh, greetings, everyone. My name is Fanny Gondwe. I'm the founder and executive director of Perisha Agro. We are based in Nirongwe, Malawi. So I am representing the private sector, specifically the small and medium enterprises, the SMEs. Um, Perisha Agro aims at improving the nutritional status of women and children under five by promoting the growing and consumption of nutritious food crops. And this includes orange fresh sweet potato, uh, orange maize, cassava, and beans. So specifically for now, we are working with smallholder farmers. We are also seed multipliers of orange fresh sweet potato vines and cassava cuttings. So we work with farmers, we distribute the vines and the cassava cuttings, and they also buy uh, from the seed companies, the orange maize, 
uh, seed. So when uh, the crops are ready, we buy the raw materials and we start processing. Currently, we are processing orange fresh sweet potato flour, but uh, very soon we'll start processing uh, orange fresh sweet potato uh, puree also. And we are also processing cassava products, the high quality cassava flour, uh, cassava starch, and the fermented cassava flour, we call it kondori. And we are also processing orange maize flour. So why we are doing all this is because uh, we are trying to help uh, reducing stunting. In Malawi, uh, stunting levels are at 37.1% as compared to 29.3% in Southern Africa region. So most uh, smallholder farmers like the rural population cannot afford to buy the nutritional supplements, but they have the locally produced food crops, the staple foods like maize. Normally our main staple food is maize and that's the white maize. But what we are trying to do is substitute white maize with vitamin A maize, that's orange maize. So we are working in partnership with Harvest Plus and uh, recently Harvest Plus has launched a brief policy on biofortification. And this policy has been endorsed by the government. And apart from that, even the government itself, it has not been easy working with the government but it has been possible working with them. So we are also working with the academia, the research institutions, and then we are also working with the local as well as international organizations. So far, there are many uh, documents, the policy documents, strategic documents, they are there that are guiding. So by doing this, uh, Normally what is happening when we are processing the sweet potato fluff, for example, because um, people have been asking, how are you processing? And I'm asked how we process our products. We buy from the farmers, for example, the sweet potato as I've mentioned, and then we process the flour. We use the uh, solar dryer houses. For now we have the solar dryer rooms too, of course. We use them to dry our, uh, sweet potato peeled uh, or unpeeled uh, roots. And then once they are dried, we mill and then we pack and sell. So, so far the response has been, uh, I should say at first it was not easy, but now people are trying to get it. Government has also been uh, doing the awareness campaigns, and all those that they should be able to understand the value, uh, the nutritional value of the uh, biofortified food um, products like the sweet potato, orange face sweet potato, uh, orange maize and beans, mainly noa beans with zinc and other food crops. So the Harvest Plus, for example, has been on top uh, Harvest Plus in Malawi has been on top of helping us like the SMEs. Uh, they help us in, in many ways, training us, and then we also go back and train our farmers. They also sometimes buy our products, for example, maybe the sweet potato vines, and then they distribute to the rural population and other NGOs also like um, International Potato Center, CIP, FAO, um, GIZ is buying the cassava, and then the feed the future is also buying the sweet potato. We sell to these international organizations and then they channel them to the with a, a great response, I should say, because so far we have reached out to 24,000 households with our biofortified food crops, uh, specifically orange fresh sweet potato and also uh, orange maize. But we can do better with the government. Uh, because we have a program called Affordable Input Program, AIP, that the government has rolled out for some time now. And this program, they sell seeds uh, at a reduced price. Um, and then this is, for example, white maize. 
We are also lobbying that they can also include the orange maize, the vitamin A maize, so that it's, it's, it is going uh, alongside the white maize. And then farmers can also be um, helped by growing the orange maize because they, will, they know that they will have the already available market. Otherwise, it's a challenge now because of the market also. Where are they going to sell if they produce more? And also the processing equipment, if government or international organizations can help SMEs to access the uh, processing equipment, we can be processing more. Uh, for example, I've said I'll start processing OFSP puree. Uh, we'll be selling to bakeries so that they can be making bread. I will not be making bread, but there will be others making bread. So I'll be uh, able to process puree and sell to bakeries. Bakeries will process bread, and then it will reach out to more um, customers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Gondry. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting when you are saying if only it could be the orange maize can be included with the government uh, support process. And so hopefully my sister from Zambia, uh, Ms. Dorothy Sikazwe, might share something with us, on, on that uh, with us. Um, so our next speaker, just jumping over the border from Malawi into Zambia, is Dorothy Sikazwe, nutritionist at the Ministry of Health in Zambia. Uh, over to you, uh, Dorothy, putting you on the spot to see whether you can share something for Ms. Gondry as well. Over to you. Okay. Um... Okay, yeah, so thank you very much. Hello from Zambia and Ampolo <laughs> and everyone. Yeah, so thank you very much. Um, I, I've really benefited from uh, uh, learning from, from the other speakers. Um, I, I, I struggled a little bit. I wanted to, to post a question, but uh, for some reason I, I couldn't do it. And uh, I, I think I'm going to discuss uh, or rather just raise it when we begin to, to discuss. Uh, so for Zambia, uh, like it, has, it was mentioned, Zambia was given as an example of uh, a country which is implementing biofortification, and uh, this is rightly so. Through, the, um, through uh, Harvest Plus, uh, we have benefited and we have uh, been shown evidence on uh, how biofortification can actually uh, help in our meeting uh, the nutrition of the women, uh, the, the young children, and of course the whole family. Um, so we we have adopted some of the uh, the food products that have been biofortified uh, through the, the the work of of uh, Ministry of Agriculture and uh, um, Harvest Plus and other partners uh, into recipes that we have we use to. Um, deliver uh, IEC and social behavior change communication to the women. Uh, the Ministry of Health, for example, has been a platform that uh, Harvest Plus has used uh, to test uh, the acceptability of the products. And uh, this has been through uh, taking part in, um, in, in public fairs, uh, for example, we have, uh, before the COVID arrived, we have had been having um, National Health Week uh, events, and there Harvest Plus uh, could, could bring their products and make into uh, food, uh, which, which, which is common for, for most of the people, and save the people and uh, get their views. And uh, I think from there, it was, uh, apart from other ways, of course, it was shown that uh, these products are actually acceptable. And from there, they, they have been able to go on the market. Uh, we do have, uh, apart from um, the, uh, uh, the orange uh, mess, we have the, the products from that uh, as in uh, some, which, which can also be called mess grits. And so uh, some of the, um, the, the children's uh, blended uh, food uh, products are also uh, based on the uh, on the um, orange orange maize. So I think that um, the acceptability uh, has been there for for us. And so um, because of the 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 the, the, um, the collaboration, I think, and the evidence that has been uh, produced and 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 shared by 
by, by, by Harvest Help. We have also uh, adopted the, uh, the varieties into uh, farmer input support programs, uh, whereby farmers have been provided with uh, this maize seed, as well as the sweet potato uh, seed, uh, the orange flesh sweet potato seed. And we've also had other um, NGOs uh, getting the uh, iron rich beans. I know of um, one of our, our partner organizations, uh, Self Help Africa. They have uh, grown beans in, in one of our parts of the country, and they have demonstrated how this uh, can also be prepared into nutritious meals. And they have demonstrated also how children can also be able to, you know, to, 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 to intake uh, the, the, the same products. So uh, for Ministry of Health, where I am actually based, I think we have provided a platform because uh, of the clients that we see in uh, women uh, that come for antenatal and other services, and also in the women as they bring their children to under five clinics. And so we have um, helped or rather participated in uh, sensitizing and popularizing uh, these uh, uh, biofortified products. In, uh, in, in, a, in a nutshell, I would like to say that um, the, the, the strategy of biofortification uh, and fortification uh, generally is something that is within our uh, national health, uh, uh, national uh, food and uh, nutrition uh, strategic, strategic plan. Uh, right here where I am, we are formulating our next uh, national health strategic plan, uh, 2022 to 2026. And one of the things that we have identified is to uh, push the agenda of fortification. Uh, so uh, I think that um, we, are, uh, we have adopted uh, the technology that has come through um, international NGOs as it were and the other um, line ministries uh, through the Ministry of Agriculture. Maybe I'd also like to say that um, we, have, um, we are participating, of course, in the uh, Scaling Up Nutrition, and we have the 1,000 Most Critical Days program. Which is, uh, which is focusing on reduction of stunting uh, among the, the, the children under five. And so we, we have a collaborating, uh, rather a coordination structure at the uh, very top of uh, government, which is uh, actually um, com composed of permanent secretaries. These are like uh, chief executives of uh, line ministries, uh, which will include Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Education, Minister of Community Development, Minister of Fish and Livestock, and um, Ministry of, of Chiefs and um, other ministries that are relevant. They find themselves uh, coming to discuss nutrition through what is called a special committee of permanent secretaries on nutrition. And this is uh, actually chaired uh, by the um, secretary to the cabinet. And so it has attention of, of, of the highest level of government. And so I think that uh, because of that, we are able to take issues to, to, to this body through the various other platforms under the Scaling Up Nutrition. So I think that uh, the collaboration that we have had and, and also the oversight and, and the, the, the chain reaction that uh, biofortification has really created has uh, made it find its uh, rightful place. And I think we, we would like to go with it uh, in our interventions. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. A lot of lessons uh, learned there. And I think, by the way, congratulations on the food-based dietary guidelines. It was thank nice you. to see that it's, it's orange maize that is being yes. reflected uh, yes. on the plot mo uh, on the plate model there. So thank you for that. Um, it looks like we do have um, Mr. Uh, Gon Dr. Gondwe is with us now. Dr. Gondwe, can I pass on to you uh, to take us through what Uganda is doing uh, quickly? Thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Namukolo. I hope I'm audible enough. Yes, you are audible. We Thank can hear you. you. Been, uh, I've just been upgraded to a panelist now, but uh, greetings to everybody on this call and allow me to thank the organizers for the opportunity to share our experience, but also progress 
on biofortification research with the NARO. NARO is the National Agricultural Research Organization in Uganda. And our institute has a mandate for staple crops, including root and tubers, cereals, legumes, and agriculture. So it addresses key issues with food security. And uh, our focus on micronutrient, my biofortification has been micronutrient arrangement. And we'll focus on some of the key micronutrients that have public health concern and with the severe clinical manifestations, which have been highlighted, including stunting, underweight, uh, anemia, and also uh, children being wasted. And in that regard, our effort on the research on micronutrient enrichment in staple crop food crops started more than 20 years ago. And I'm happy we have made good progress on that front. And uh, in that area, I'm going to highlight a number of achievements we've made in terms of micronutrient enrichment and also vitamin A rich staple food crops. Uh, one is the progress on the sweet potato. We have so far eight sweet potato varieties that are on the market, commercial varieties that have been promoted, which are very high in vitamin A content. We have uh, two orange maize now. It's before variety list committee and as soon as they convene, we shall have those two varieties hopefully uh, for the, in the hands of the farmers. We have two cassava varieties that are very promising and also in the pipeline for vitamin, with vitamin A uh, enrichment. We also have banana, that is an advanced stages, which is also enriched with vitamin A. As you know, matoke is a key food security crop in Uganda here. Uh, the other micronutrient we have also made progress in is zinc and iron. And in that front, we have released seven bean varieties with more than 30 parts per billion in terms of zinc and more than 70 parts per billion. And we have in pipeline varieties that have better levels of zinc and iron that will be coming through. Uh, we have also work going on maize. We have acquired zinc donors and we have a breeding program going on for zinc rich maize. And also we're in the process of acquiring iron rich uh, maize varieties that will be coming into the pipeline. Uh, in the past, we have done a lot of work on QPM particularly the focus on tryptophan and lysine. And those varieties are currently also on the market. The popular one being longer five. One of our recent effort now has been on sweet potato, which is purple for increased anthocyanin. And we think that will also have a good, great benefit for farmers in Uganda uh, as we move forward uh, with our fortification effort. And uh, having mentioned all that, I think we still have challenges that we think we need to also present. Number one, I think we're looking at how innovative we can scale and expand the reach of these biofortified products with the farmers so that uh, the, the increase and in access can, 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 can increase. Number two, also this goes with the data for evidence-based decision, but also policy making regarding biofortification efforts and also promotion. And that's something which we think also needs to come strong with the strong communication and aggressive communication program because also some of these crops, as mentioned, have myths around them. For example, maize, people here are used to white maize, and very soon we're exposing them to orange maize. And I think that needs to come with a lot of uh, campaigns and also communication efforts. Uh, also efforts to prioritize scale up around uh, EGS, which is the algeration seed, which is a key, key factor in terms of uh, scaling these biofortified products also something we have to look at. And lastly, also in terms of nutrition, it is important to note that issues of quality assurance and quality control are very important so that the farmers and the consumers get the benefit they desire from these products. But that said, we are most happy to report our build capacity in terms of, uh, in terms of analytics, but also profiling for nutrition. We have a nutritional lab here at our institute with the capacity uh, for a number of micronutrients, uh, using HPLC, using NIAs and also handheld NIAs that are installed. We have spectrophometers. We have other labs which are dedicated to protein work and carbohydrate work. So all that we think will increase our effort 
moving forward with strong pipelines in bridging these micronutrient dense rich food crops as we move forward. And thank you very much for the partners, especially Harvest Plus, on the promotion of SADAC has been able to do a lot of work here in the country. We've also been able to work with the civil society and also the ministry in terms of policy on nutrition and food safety is very key. And with that, I want to thank you all for your kind attention and look forward to the questions uh, to be addressed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Goffrey, and thank you for being patient uh, with the system. Um, we, we will now move on to a video before we get into Q&A uh, session. And the video is from uh, TAT, and, and I pass on to Sagal now, over to you for the TAT video. Sagal? It's wheat harvest time in Ethiopia's Awash region. The yield is looking more interesting than ever for farmers like Chartu Kepene using specialized wheat seed varieties more tolerant to the heat. In the past, productivity of the land was very low due to the flooding of the river. But this year, I'm very excited about the wheat crop. I expect a yield of 4.5 to 5 tons per hectare. Kebede's wheat crop is part of a 200,000 hectare of lowland irrigated wheat program that Ethiopia started with the support of the Technologies for African Agricultural Transformation Program, or TART. Operating across nine food commodities in more than 30 countries, TART is helping Africa build back better. Next door in Sudan, TART's climate smart seeds are thriving. Sudan has just recorded its largest wheat harvest ever, 1.1 million tons of wheat in the 2019-2020 season. In Sudan and Ethiopia, hundreds of thousands of farmers now plant heat-tolerant wheat varieties that are rapidly boosting food security. TART is helping national economies create jobs, increase food security, and reduce food imports while improving the quality of life for millions of Africans. Thank you very much. So really what we have seen is an array of uh, different ways in which biofortification has been picked up uh, on the African continent, including the investments that are being made by our own uh, development bank, the African Development Bank. We now move on into Q&A. Quite a number of questions have come through. Thank you very much for the questions. Uh, some of them have already been addressed. I have seen in the chat by uh, Mr. Mavindeze. Um, but let's see if we can answer more of the questions that have been put forward. The first question that I would like to take forward is one addressed to Dr. Howdy. And Dr. Howdy, the question is, which countries in Africa are make, making most progress in scaling up uh, biofortification? Over to you. Are you able to choose? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Um... I think um, I think Donald Mabendite is probably best placed to answer that question. The Harvest Plus director for Africa. I know we've made a lot of we've made good progress in Nigeria, uh, Uganda. Um, you know we've had presentations from Zambia, Zimbabwe. But I'll, I'll turn it over to Donald. Yeah, Donald, tell us thank which you. country has made the most progress. Okay, thank you very much. So. Uh, I think the most amount of progress has been made in, uh, in Nigeria, um, where more than uh, 2.5 million uh, farming households are now growing biofortified crops. But also, it's a function of really the size of the country. Um, uh, the, Nigeria is quite a big country. Uh, if I look at other countries such as uh, Rwanda, uh, we we've since uh, handed over 
uh, our work on biofortification in Rwanda to other stakeholders and other partners that are working along the uh, bean value chain. But when we were exiting the country, uh, about 20% of the beans that were consumed in uh, Rwanda were actually high-end beans. So we've made some progress there as well. Uh, we continue to strive to move the needle in all the other countries where we're operating. So we are uh, making uh, quite a bit of progress as I had uh, earlier alluded to um, in my presentation. More than 6.5 million households generally in Africa are growing these crops um, with more than uh, 35 million uh, people benefiting. Thank you, Anamkola. But, but would it be correct, before I let you go, uh, would it be correct though to think in terms of that it, the progress actually varies depending on different African countries because they are the approach is, is, is rather different, right? That's correct. That, actually, that's correct. Uh, uh, it varies uh, according to when the program uh, to, to scale biofortification was started in the country, the population, and the mechanisms. In some countries, as you rightly uh, uh, say, uh, put it in Namkolo, there is um, um, a commercial model. Commercial models move fairly quickly and we are able to scale faster. But in some countries such as DRC, for example, we have predominantly social models um, and those really take time, more time for us to scale. Thank you. Uh, Miss Dorothy, I would like to pass the next question to you. Uh, since you are in the Ministry of Health, I know you are behind a lot of the work that is ongoing for the Nutrition for Growth Summit. The question is, with the Nutrition for Growth Summit around the corner, what are the priorities uh, for perhaps the Zambian government in this case to help scale up uh, biofortification? Any, any specifics specifically for the Nutrition for Growth Summit? Over to you, Ms. Kazu. Right, thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so for the Nutrition for Growth, uh, we are looking at reviewing some of the commitments that we made uh, in the previous uh, round of uh, Nutrition for Growth Summit and uh, also pushing some of the agenda that have not moved. Uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, fortification um, generally is something that we have not uh, done very well uh, in, in Zambia. And this is uh, something we're still pushing because we realize that um, it's very difficult to get to have children um, taking nutrient dense uh, foods that uh, will, will address the stunting that we are um, trying to reduce. Uh, so apart from some uh, other uh, high intervention, um, high impact interventions, um, biofortification is something that uh, we would like to push um, again in this, uh, in this round of uh, scaling up nutrition too, and our own uh, local program here at home. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And, and I, I wanna take the next question I want to pass on to uh, Dr. Godfrey. And, I, and I'm specifically picking on you on this question because you, uh, you are affiliated to a research uh, institution on the African continent. The question is since 1945, uh, I don't see enough impacts that have been made in food systems. We need to know what the bottlenecks are. So for, for our continent, for the Southern and Eastern Africa region, for example, what, what are the bottlenecks that are hindering us from attaining better food systems transformation? Over to you, Dr. Godfrey. Thank you for that question. I think what comes to my mind is number one, evidence around food systems, but also in the particular case, nutrition, and the number of people have been able to reach. Number two, there have also been policy challenges related to food systems, and also the cropping systems in Africa, as you know, is very diverse and it causes issues. But also I've seen emerging issues such as climate change. That also is complicating the situation further. And all this also make it difficult uh, for improved food systems in Africa. 
And that case is similar in most of the African countries. So that will be my quick reactions to, 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 to the challenges regarding the food systems. Thank you. So really, it, the, the implication then is that the era we are in now of trying to focus more on food systems transformation, that we must really pay attention to climate issues, because if that's one of the of the big bottlenecks. Uh, this leads to, well to the next question, which I will pass on to um, Donald. Um, Donald, the question is the fact that climate change is a major threat, as we've just heard, uh, for agriculture in Africa. But how does, uh, how does it affect biofortified crops? Uh, do we know yet? Over to you, Donald. Okay, yes, uh, thank you very much, Namkolo. So um, some, uh, some research has, has shown that um, generally for crops that the, the level of micronutrients will decline, especially as the uh, globe warms up, as the world warms up, the, the level of micronutrients in the, in the crops will decline. But the biofortified crops have got the advantage that they are inherently more, much more uh, dense in these micronutrients. So even if there's a decline, they will still have uh, an advantage over the non-biofortified uh, crops. Uh, also, I just wanted to say that um, as we were developing, or as we entered this area of developing biofortified uh, varieties, we wanted to make sure that uh, we are building on some of the advancement that uh, crop breeding and research has made in terms of mitigating some of the uh, issues that are brought about by climate change, such as uh diseases such as uh drought and so on so you find that uh, most of the uh, varieties if not all the varieties that are that we have developed which are biofortified are actually uh either drought tolerant or disease resistant and so on and therefore are able to uh, and they are, are able they are actually climate smart uh giving them advantage in that not only do they give more nutrients to communities but they are also uh uh, climate smart. Thank okay, you. That, that is very reassuring that we are not only addressing micronutrients, but also uh, the climate challenges that are with us. Uh, the next question goes to Ms. Fanny Gondwe. Um, the question has to do with the private sector and the, the, the audience member wants to know what is the role of private sector in advancing biofortification in Africa and also associated with that how can businesses be incentivized to produce and sell biofortified seeds and crops? This is an area where you shared some challenges before. Over to you. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, so uh, as SMEs, as small medium enterprises, we, we lack a lot of things. Um, I mentioned about the processing equipment. I mentioned that if we could have ready available market, but we could also uh, do more on our own if we are really set. Uh, for example, I am an established SME. That means I have um, offices, I have farm, I have uh, at least an uh, equipment to start with, so that when I'm looking for um, additional support, at least I am set. So that should be number one. I have to be set on my own before I start asking for. Uh, that could uh, help uh, bringing in, at least making a conducive environment. But all the same, uh, as I mentioned, the government is really trying, is doing uh, awareness campaigns on uh, uh, nutritional food products, and now by fortification of uh, the locally produced foods, as I mentioned also. So if we can work hand in hand with the rural population, those are the engines, those are the champions, those are the ones whom we, we, we depend on, because if they don't produce, the raw material will not have the pro processed products. So we need to work hand in hand with the rural population, um, train them, uh, help them to understand the biofortification of uh, these uh, food crops, mainly those that they are producing themselves. Sweet potato, everywhere you find sweet potato, it could be white, 
But now we are trying to replace the white with the orange one. Replace the white maze with the orange maze. So those are the issues that we need to stand and to be on top of that. For now, I, I guess I can. Yeah, that's, that's a nice place to stop actually, replace. <laughs> Let's replace the white with the yellow um, everywhere. Um, the one thing I want to, we, we're running out of time. So for the next question, I actually want all the panelists to address it, not but you're going to do it in the chat because we don't have time. Um, and the question has to do with um, the issue of um, gender, actually. And the person asks, how can we, uh, how can we ensure that um, gender is actually addressed effectively as part of uh, biofortification? If you can write something in the chat for us to all panelists. And then in the meantime, I will pass on to Segal again to take us to another Mentimeter. Over to you, Segal, for the Mentimeter. Thank you. I'm just gonna quickly put the, uh, the link in the chat box. So just give me a second, please. I can see how Howdy already says, target women farmers in the agriculture extension. Thank you. The link for the Mentimeter is in the chat. So while we're waiting for those responses, um, the next question on the Mentimeter is asking if in Zambia, how many smallholder farming households we're growing vitamin A maize at the end of 2020. So perhaps maybe we can reflect on some of the conversation we had today. So in this case, it is indeed the last option, 284,000. Do you have any thoughts on this, Namakolo? In terms of um, how many smallholder households were growing vitamin A maize, In well, I have no basis of knowing how many, <laughs> other <laughs> than the fact that Is I know. Yes, I know that they had access to the input support program uh, through the subsidy program, so that that would have helped. And then the next question is asking, which country has not yet officially released an iron biofortified bean variety? So we have Botswana, Zimbabwe, Uganda, and Tanzania as options. Well, for the few that have taken part, uh, Botswana is the correct response, which is the majority of the responses. So we have quite the knowledgeable group. So that, that's, mm -hmm. that's interesting, actually, because um, Botswana actually does have quite a large consumption of beans, especially in their uh, school feeding program. So uh, Kifilwe, there's some work for you to do there, I think. Um, so, so now we move on to the last part of our program, and really it is for me to um, wrap up in terms of what we have gathered uh, so far. It's very clear that there's a lot of potential for biofortification on the African continent, but also clear that many African countries have come on board and picked up biofortification as a strategy that could be used to address hidden hunger. We are in a way fortunate in that the varieties that have been uh, developed that address uh, vitamin A, uh, zinc, and iron, all three micronutrients really of big health concern on the African continent are now being bred into the very staple foods that we depend on. So this is really a plus. 
But looking at the way in which the work is evolving in different countries, there is an effort to bring on board multiple stakeholders. So we have the school feeding programs coming on board, providing a market for the smallholder farmers who embark on growing biofortified crops. We also have these crops being bred with attention to agronomic traits such as drought resistance, as well as high yielding uh, varieties. That is a plus so that farmers can adopt these crops without losing out, but in fact gain on some of these agronomic uh, activities. Bringing on board institutions such as AUDA NEPAD to be one of the big advocates for biofortification is also an advantage that positions the continent well for policy change as well. So there's really quite a lot uh, that is happening with respect to biofortification. And then of course, not to forget the African Development Bank coming on board very strongly picking up biofortification as a technology that is worth investing in as part of addressing hidden hunger across the continent. And so really the onus is now upon us on how we leverage all these opportunities that are availing themselves to ensure that our countries uh, benefit effectively from the biofortification that we now have on the continent. And I might add there that there is movement continentally towards a declaration on biofortification, hopefully this coming year as part of the uh, heads of state summit of the African Union. And on that, I would like to say thank you very much to all our speakers uh, for their time in uh, preparing for this session, as well as for really sharing a lot of lessons that we, uh, we can take home and, and build on uh, going forward. And so I say thank you to um, all the speakers, uh, starting from the African Development Bank to uh, Mr. Gaba, who spoke to us, and then our keynote speaker, Dr. Howdy Boyce, um, Mr. Donald Mavindize, the Director for Harvest Plus Africa, and then Mr. Amin Idris from AUDN NEPAD. Uh, Miss Margaret, we didn't see what we look forward to seeing her sometime soon. Uh, Dr. Godfrey Asia, thank you. Mr. Njovu, uh, Miss Gondwe, Miss Sikazwe, and Sigal, thank you also for the Mentimeters and the videos and everybody in the background uh, giving us tech support. Thank you very much to everybody. And I wish you uh, a good almost ended week and best wishes for next week. Uh, and as we move on to the Nutrition for Growth Summit, I hope we, you will carry biofortification with you in your toolkits to be invested in. Thank you and best wishes. Thank you.